as he said, and let the wife see that she respects the husband. You know, as we look at this morning's scripture reading, Ephesians chapter 5, there's so much in this chapter that, I mean, we could spend, we could spend months in this chapter. I mean, after all, you have the, the husband and wife issue at the last part of the chapter. And, and there's so much to be said. There, you, and with that, you have the relationship that Christ has with the church, the body of believers. But, uh, so, you know, it's impossible to address everything that, that would be in this chapter. But I want us to think about um, the, uh, the Apostle Paul here talks about things in verse 2. He says, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself a, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And so one of the ways that we do that is to try to conform ourselves, walking in love, not just love of one another, but love of God, to walk in that love of God, is to try to conform ourselves to the image of our beloved Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so if you look down here, I want to draw your attention to one other verse, two other verses, I guess, they are joined together. Verse 15, look carefully how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wives. And in verse 16, the King James Version, instead of saying making the best use of the time, would say redeeming the time because the days are evil. Now, did Paul write this 2,000 years ago? Or did he write it this past year? I mean, with COVID-19, are the days not evil? With the elections looming ahead in the near future, are the days not evil? So let's let's think about making the best use of our time and how how we can one of the ways we can do that is to control our thought process. And so in the line of controlling our thought process and making some emotions, I want us to talk about lust for a moment. And did you ever wonder where lust come from comes from? And what, you know, what does the Bible talk about lust? Where does it ultimately lead to? So we'll delve into God's word and see what it comes from. If we look back at Genesis chapter one, uh, 3, we see Eve in the garden. I'm not, I'm not going to turn there for time's sake this morning. But we see Satan is tempting Eve. And, and, and you know, but... But there's a little bit more than that. But let, actually, let's go ahead and go back there. I'm sorry. But the, but there's just, just some details I want us to pick up. Genesis chapter 3 and in verse 1. Now the serpent, which Satan has taken on the form of a snake, was more crafty than any other beast of the field the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say to you, do not eat of anything? any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you, sh uh, you shall not uh, of the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, now here's, here's Satan, and he is He's planting the seeds of lust in Eve's mind. Notice here, but the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Okay, he's planting the seeds of lust, but look at the following verse. Look at verse 6. Here is really where lust is actually coming from within Eve. Satan is planted the seeds, and so she gives a little bit of heed to that. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was delightful to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit. End of story. 
So what Satan did was he really played on Eve's desires. He said, you're going to be wise. She had a desire to be wise. And, and, and she looked at it as pleasant to the eyes. You know, lust is the same way today. Nothing's changed. Thousands of years have gone by. Hundreds and thousands of generations have passed. Human nature still the same. James, in James chapter 1 and verse 14, reminds us of this very thing. James wrote his letter thousands of years later than what Adam and Eve walked the face of the earth. James 1.14 says, But when each person is tempted, he is lured and enticed of his own desires. Your King James Version will say lust there. Of his own lust. Then desire or lust, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. We see that lived out in the life of Adam and Eve. We see that desire to be wise, the desire to have something, then the act upon it, that was sin. Was it sinful for Eve to desire the fruit? No. It was not. It was simply the first step down the road to death and destruction. And when sin, when sin conceived, it brought forth death. Ultimately, Adam and Eve died. Just as you and I. And so death entered the world because of their sin. But it all began with the desire. Also, if Jesus mentioned something in Mark's Gospel, chapter 7, talking about it coming from ourselves, it comes from our very hearts. In Mark chapter 7, I believe we'll begin in verse 21. Now, I think it's important for us. You may, you may wonder, what, what are we talking about this for this morning? Well, it, it is, of course, to help us have a closer relationship with God. And in order to have a closer relationship with God, we have to understand how Satan operates in order to avoid sin and temptation. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 7, down in verse uh, 21. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. Jesus' point about in this passage was, what comes from outside does not defile a person. Satan's tempting of Eve in the Garden of Eden did not defile Eve. It was when she gave in to her own desires. Sure, Satan planted the seeds, but she gave in to her own desires. She made the conscious decision. And so the same goes for us. When we make a conscious decision within our hearts, that is when we become defiled. A conscious decision to violate what God has commanded us. So what is lust? Well, lust is wanting something that we do not have. And it is wanting something so much that it becomes so important to us that it separates us from God. Once something is not wrong. But it's when we put such a priority sticker on wanting that that it becomes more important to us than following God. Again, back to Adam and Eve in the book of Genesis chapter 3. Was it wrong for Eve to want, to desire to have the fruit? Not necessarily, but it was a slippery slope. And it was the beginning of the path to sin. And so what we as Christians need to do is we need to process these things. 
in our mind. God gave us a fabulous mind, a fabulous brain that works faster than any computer the world has ever known. And so God gave us the ability to think, the ability to reason. Eve knew the end result. She confessed the end result to Satan when he tempted her. She knew the end result, and yet she gave in to her desires. And, and so that desire was not necessarily wrong, but when she gave in to it, it separated her from the commandments of God. Don't eat from this tree. And so in the book of Psalms, chapter 81, the 81st Psalm in verse 12, the psalmist says, So I gave them over to stubborn hearts to follow their own counsel. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would soon subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. The psalmist is reminding us that when we walk as God would have us to walk, these are the benefits. Oh, let's see. The benefits are, are really incredible here. He says in verse 14, he would sub subdue our enemies. He would turn his hand against our foes. We all have enemies. Now, they may not be in the form of people. Maybe, and, and I think this is the case with most of us, maybe our greatest enemy is Satan himself. Resist the devil, he will flee from you, James reminds us. So what's wrong with wanting something? Well, again, lust is wanting something that is not rightfully ours. That's where Eve made her mistake. And consequently, that is where you and I can make our mistakes is wanting something that God does not want us to have. Now, you know, Eve didn't need that fruit in order to be perfectly happy, to be perfectly content. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 8, Solomon, now here's a man that knows lust. Here's a man that knows desires. In fact, Solomon says, I held nothing back for myself. You know, if I wanted it, I got it. And here at the end of his life, he's writing his memoirs, if you will, summing everything up. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 8, he says, All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. You know, when it's the end of your life and you're an old man, You've had everything the world has had. There's just nothing there. You know, it's all in it. How many times does Solomon say in the book of Ecclesiastes? It's all vexation. Vanity and vexation of spirit. How many times he says that to us? And yet we sometimes, sometimes we have to live it ourselves in order to realize the reality of it. We can read about it, but sometimes experience is the greatest teacher. But it's always good for us to study so that we understand when that experience strikes home what's going on. The Gospel of Mark chapter 4 and in verse 19. Jesus says, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word. Now here's the danger of desires of other things. In this, in this parable that Jesus is giving, he's telling the purpose of this parable to his apostles. He's saying the word of God. When, when something enter, enters in, the word of God is, is the seed. And, and when, when, when desires of other things enter in, it, it tends to choke our desire for the word of God. That's when danger sets in. You know, it, it's throughout, throughout my personal life, 
there are things I wanted to do. And there's things I've tried to do. And we've started down a path, Kate and I have started down a path, and sometimes we get partway down this decision, we make a decision, our life is going to go in this direction. We're going to have, you know, this wonderful farm and we're going to raise our children there. And then, you know, suddenly we realize the amount of work involved is taking time away from study. The amount of, of work and stress involved is eroding not only our, our relationship with each other and our closeness as a family sometimes, but we've had to step back and reevaluate. It can erode our faith. It takes away time from what we need to be doing for Christ. And so we've had to kind of restructure our lives from time to time. Different decisions, different restructuring processes have taken place, and that's good. You know, the definition of life is the ability to adapt ourselves to our surroundings. You know, a tree or any living thing really has to adapt itself to the environment in which it lives. That's our nature. And we need to make sure that the environment in which we live is not choking our faith. And so that's the danger of wanting something so badly that we deprioritize our faith. And so the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and in verse 27 says this, But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others I myself should be disqualified. Paul says, you know, I'm an apostle. I discipline my body. I discipline my desires, my wants, my needs even. And I control what I want. I control what I need. Why? Paul says, Paul says, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. The King James Version says a castaway. The Apostle Paul is afraid that, you know what, if I don't have self-control, if I don't exercise control over my own desires, my own body, I may never make it to heaven. This is, the, in, in my estimation, one of the greatest men that ever walked the face of the earth. One of the greatest Christians that ever lived. Over here in chapter 10, over a chapter in verse 13, Paul think, brings up this thought again. And, and in verse 13, he says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. What comfort we can take from that. To realize that every temptation that you and I will ever face, hundreds or thousands of other people have faced it before us. God is faithful and he will not let you to be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation he will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Maybe we don't want that escape sometimes, but it's there. God is faithful, and if anyone knows it, the Apostle Paul knows it. You know, lust takes on many forms, and, and I'll, I'll give you a few examples, and you can fill in the blanks with whatever it is that you personally might struggle with in your life. You know, and look, we've talked in the past about David and Bathsheba. Sex is something that a lot of people struggle with. Sexual lust and sexual desires, believe me, I've worked construction. I can tell you stories that are unfit to be heard of the sexual desires of individuals. And so that's an example. Money. You know, money... Paul reminds Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9 through 11, is the root of all kinds of evil. Money equals power. Power itself can be the source of loss. So sometimes we, we tend to, and, and I suppose I, I myself fall into this category. You know, Kate and I were talking, I think it was yesterday, 
maybe the late, maybe Friday, but I think it was yesterday. You know, talking to contractors today, you hear them, oh, you know, these guys don't show up to work on time, and in case like you were always there. I'm like, dear, I got paid by the hour. Of course I'm going to be there. She's like, you always work late. Of course I got paid by the hour. You know, and, and so I, I kind of fell into that trap as I was working construction when I was younger. You know, I would be there on time. Oh, uh, overtime? Oh, yeah. I, I'm there. I'm your man. You know, hey, I've got eight kids. Come on, give me a break. I didn't have eight kids at that point in time. But nevertheless, what I realized in the later years of construction was this is problematic. You know, we need, we, and we reached a point in our lives where we've made a decision. For multiple reasons, I left the company that I worked for. Left it on good terms, still on good terms. Every once in a while, my boss, now it's been a while since he's done this, but every once in a while, my boss, Tom, you ready to come back to work yet? Oh, I was afraid that'd be the answer. But nevertheless, you know, maybe, maybe our desires are a new car, a better job, a new house, fame. Like I say, fill in the blank. We all have different things. What, what you struggle with, what you desire, uh, I may not want. But all of us have different things we struggle with in our lives. I guess in short, to sum it up, Lust, perhaps, is best described as love of ourselves. I will. It's all about me. One thing I've learned in marriage, having kids, particularly having kids, it can't be about me. You know, the I've always said, you know, that one of the most humbling things is to carry a new baby in. You're the proud father. You bring your new baby into church for the first time. Oh, what a cute little baby. And everybody moves and awes over the baby. I forget you even exist. Hello, I'm holding the kid. You know, but but that's that's it's not all about me. And yet lust and desire tells us that it is about us. It's about what I want, not what Kate wants. It's about what I want. Not about what the kids want. That's lust. When I prioritize myself and my own desires, my own wants, above what someone else wants or desires. And I have yet to conquer this. It is, it is certainly something that I struggle with. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, we all struggle with it to one degree or another. The Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2 tells Timothy this, and we'll begin in verse 1. He says, but understand that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy. We can go on down the list, but you get the point. The last days, I believe we're living in the last days. The Bible teaches us that we are living in the last days. And so is it any surprise that people are self-centered? What they want is what they work for, not perhaps what's best for their families. I want us to look at what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6. Oh, sorry, 16. Matthew chapter 16 and down in verse 36 of that chapter, which is not correct. Uh, there's a typo on this, on this screen. I think what we want is Matthew... Chapter 16, verse 3. And it says here, Jesus said to them, Watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. 
And they began discussing it among themselves, saying, We brought no bread. But Jesus, aware of this, said, Oh, you of little faith, why are you discussing among yourselves the fact that you have no bread? Do you not perceive? Do you not remember the five loaves for the 5,000? How many baskets have you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many baskets you gathered? How is it that you fail to understand that I did not speak about bread? You know, the disciples were, were, they were worried about themselves. They were worried about, uh-oh, we're, we're going to be in trouble with the Lord. And they're discussing who... It is that's responsible for this. You know, Jesus has a way of taking what we have and multiplying it to meet our needs. Jesus has a way of taking what we have with us. And he gives two instances here in this passage. He gives an instance of five loaves to feed 5,000 people. He has an instance of seven loaves to feed 4,000. Well, wouldn't you think seven loaves to feed 7,000 people or five loaves to feed 5,000 people? No, that's not the way God works. He takes whatever we happen to have, multiplies it, to make it satisfactory for our needs at the present time. Let's go back into James chapter 1 again. And we, we looked at verse 14 once before. I want us to glance at that again. And, and in this thought process of where, where our lust comes from, James, James describes so vividly for us how it comes from ourselves. I want us to look at the, the larger context here this time. James chapter 1, beginning in verse 12, at the beginning of that paragraph. James says, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. You know, it's when we're tried. It was when Eve was tried that she gave in to lust. Blessed is the man that under steadfast, or is steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. And he reminds us in verse 13. Let no man, no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot tempt, or God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. God is not going to put anything in our path that is going to tempt us. That's simply Satan as we look at the book of Job, we understand over to chapter 4 of the book of James and in verses 1 through 3 James says what causes quarrels and what causes fightings among you is it not of your own passions or are passions but lust what are passions but wanting something more than we want peace he says is it not your own passions that your own passions are at war with you you, you desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain. You fight and quarrel you do not you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive. Why? He says, because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. We spend it on our passions. You know, sometimes it's, it's not wrong to ask God. It's not wrong to ask God for the things that we want, the things that we desire, but let's check out our motivations. If we expect God to, to grant our requests, let's check out our motivations and make sure that our motivations are in accordance with the will of God. Maybe God doesn't want us to have whatever it is. Do you ever think about it? And sometimes hindsight is perfect vision. 
Sometimes it's been said hindsight is, is 20 20. We look back at our lives and we realize that when we prayed for something and we wanted it, there's times I wanted it so bad and I prayed so hard and I never got it. And I can look back years later and I can say, aha. I know why God did not give me that. Because if I had whatever it was, I wouldn't be as well off as I am today. Because God sees the bigger picture. And so sometimes in order to control our lust and our desires, we need to realize there is one who knows a whole lot more about me I know about my A word of caution. The world, the things that we possess, it cannot satisfy. In, in 1 John chapter 2, and down in, in verse 16 and 17, John says, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. You know, we could spend an entire lesson on this passage right here. Just looking at the way Satan tempts us. Satan always tempts us in three ways. Always, you can get, you can take it to the bank. The desires of the flesh, fleshly lust. The desires of the eyes, the lust of the eyes. The pride of life. All of our temptations can fall into those three categories if we think about it. We won't spend the time on that today because I want us to go back into the book of Proverbs for a moment. And see what Solomon is writing to his son in his instruction for his son in Proverbs 23 and in verse 4 and 5. Solomon says, do not toil to acquire wealth. Be discerning enough to de desist. When your eyes light on it, it is gone. For suddenly it sprouts wings. Flying like an eagle towards heaven. You know, anyone that has money in the stock market or has had money in the stock market understands what Solomon's talking about here. Don't let this take over your life, you know, because as soon as you acquire wealth, it's gone. It can dissipate just so quickly. And it can disappear from your life and you'll be left with nothing. There are times that we are better off with what we have and to be satisfied with that. The Apostle Paul, in writing to Timothy, says uh, something to that effect. And, and I don't have the passage in front of me, but I do want us to consider some things that uh, Solomon says. Over in Proverbs chapter 15 and in verse 16, Proverbs 15, 16, Solomon says, Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. How many wars could have been saved, prevented? How many lives could have been saved if world leaders in our past history had heeded Solomon? And over in Proverbs chapter 28 and in verse 6, Solomon says, better is a poor man who walks in his integrity than a rich man who is crooked in his ways. Why don't we consider heeding a few of these warnings and just have godliness with contentment, as Paul says, is great gain. And in the book of Psalms, Psalm 37, verse 16, the psalmist here says, better is the little that the righteous has than the abundance of many wicked. You no, know, in the end, when it's all said, it's
and be content with the things God has given us. To be free from worldly lust, to be content with those things. For godliness with contentment is great gain. To be free of worldly lust is to have the freedom to worship God, to walk with God, to dwell with God without restraint or compromise. As we wrap this morning's lesson up, let's look very quickly at a few more passages. One from Matthew chapter 7. And Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 25, 24 and 25, Matthew 7, 24, everyone who hears the words of these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Jesus reminds us that's our priority. If we base everything in our lives around that solid rock of faith, then we will have the ability to endure whatever comes our direction. And we won't be satisfied. Romans chapter 8 and down in verse 28 of that chapter, Paul says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Remember, if it doesn't work out, it's probably not from God. It's not his will. We're going to skip James, and I want us to look at a couple of thought passages. One from Paul's letter to Titus, chapter 2. Just to consider these for very briefly as we sum up this lesson. Titus chapter 2 and in verse 11. Paul says, for the grace of God has appeared to bring salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions or worldly lust, I think the King James Version says, and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. What a wonderful idea here that Paul wants us to get is that training us. Training us. That's what our faith is all about. That's what our walk is all about. Is to train us, to teach us. It's a path. And I want us to look at uh, 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2 verses 1 and 2. My little children... I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But, but, John says, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins and not ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. You know, that's such a comfort. You know, when we slip up, when we fall short of the glory of God... And we sin. When lust conceives and it brings forth sin, we have the opportunity through Jesus Christ to go to God. So you know what, God? I'm sorry. I have failed and I have sinned. And so at the close of this morning, as we contemplate our lives, and we consider where we are. I'd say it would be fair that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But we have a great God, a gracious God. A God who has the ability to make all things right. And so as we sing this Psalm 389, let's go out of this place this morning. Determined to let God have his way in our lives, regardless of what we might want or desire, let's yield to his desires, his wants. Not wrong, we want something that we would like to have, certainly not. 
So let's remember not to put a priority stamp on you. Above the priority stamp that we put on Christ. Should there be any on subject of the gospel this morning, would encourage you to make it once in which is now, scared of sin, let him have his way with it. Would you live for Jesus and be always sure and good? Would you walk with him within the narrow road? Would you have him bear your burden, carry all your love? Let him have his way with thee. His power can make you what you want to be. His blood can cleanse your heart and give you free. His love can fill your soul and you will stay. What's best for him to have his way with thee? Would you have him make you free and follow at his call? Would you know the peace that comes by giving all? Would you have him save you so that you may never fall? Let him have his way with thee. His power can make you what you ought to be. His mind can cleanse your soul and make you free. His love can fill your soul and you will see what's best for him to have his way with thee. Would you in his kingdom find the place of constant rest? Would you prove him true each providential test? Would you in his service labor always at your best? Let him have his way with thee. His power can make you what you ought to be. His blood can cleanse your heart and make you free. His love can fill your soul and you will say what's this. For him to have his way with me. Colossians, third chapter, seventeenth verse, we're told to do all, God, all that you do and want to do, work on you, do all and learn to deliver. Matthew, the twenty-sixth chapter, and the twenty-sixth verse, we have the institution of the Lord said, Jesus was protecting them. As of the priest to his disciples. And verse 26 says, Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. For the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this sweet wine until the day when I drink it to you with you in my Father's kingdom. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this bread, which represents the bread which came down from heaven. 
Christ, your Son, Jesus Christ. We are thankful for the Father and pray for your blessings at home. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So, Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this good divine, which represents the blood of the Jesus. We pray for your blessings upon it and upon our lives as we seek to show thy truth to those times. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Eight hundred twenty-four. We'll sing eight twenty-four in just a moment. Um, about a month ago, we came in and uh, the back of the building here, all the classrooms and bathrooms were uh, filled with termites, and by the end of services, they made their way out into the yard. Uh, so we've been on a waiting list for Modern Pest Control to uh, spray the building, which they did this week. Um, I was a little shocked. They were usually very, very reasonable in price. I was a little shocked when I got the bill. I think it was $900. But I understand that what they had to do was to uh, actually go under the cross space of the auditorium, which has literally tunnels underneath of it to get back into the treatment ground. It does have a five year a five-year warranty. If we see anything, they will come back and spray for free. Um, but uh, there's, there is a good amount of damage, which we were aware that there was old damage in the classroom section. Uh, so anyway, that will uh, 
that that bill is will be paid. We'll take care of that for the time being, but uh, we we'll probably have a little bit of a negative balance for a little while, just to make everyone aware of why. Um, so, 824, I'll fly away. Sing a song, be a sister. Some glad morning when this life is o'er, I'll fly away to a celestial shore. I'll so much for the gift of life, the ability to live our lives, the freedom of choice. We thank you, Father, for this great nation we live in. We pray that you would bless America, bless our leaders, and seek to honor you. Give us leaders, Father, that seek to honor you. Bless our servicemen and women who fight for the freedoms of us, the freedoms of those around the world. Father, as we embark upon a, a presidential election year, we pray that you would be with us. May your will be done. May we select a leader who will love, honor, and serve you with integrity and honesty. Father, we pray that you would help us as individuals to remember to order our lives with you the same. Father, we pray that we might grow in number here at Second Street. Help us, give us wisdom, understanding, determination, and ability to go into this community and to work to sow the seeds of your kingdom. Father, we pray for the needs of this congregation. We pray, Father, for Others who will help us in our work here, we pray that you will send a song leader in our direction, our worship may be more pleasing to you and more satisfying than perhaps to ourselves as well. And we pray, Father, for those who are sick and afflicted, that you will be with them. Be with those, Father, who have mental illnesses as well. Guide them, Father. Exactly. We ask all these things and we give you thanks and praise for everything. 
In Jesus' name. Thank you. 